next uh, so nathan was talking about a lot of practices in terms of devops and all so we have uh, sam gokenheimer here all the way from seattle uh, who would be giving you a demo about the testing and deployment uh, in a stock which is moving 65000 microsoft t's to devops on the public cloud uh, he is a product owner at Microsoft and has authored four books, the latest being Journey to Cloud Cadence. And just as a fun fact, he lives with his family in Seattle and there he has built a sustainable house which has been, you know, described in house. Looks so good. probably he can even show you the house, he has it as a Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Please do welcome him for the talk. Thank you. Okay. It, it, hello. Can you hear me? Great. Okay. Thank you for having me to Bangalore. Uh, it's an honor to go after uh, Chef and Rakuten. Uh, shout out to Ranik. I visited Rakuten last time I was in Japan. And uh, this is a cool company where um, you see the, the real practices being deployed. You see the uh, monitoring uh, displays around the walls. You see the you see Kanban being used in the meetings. And, and they're doing it at, at global st scale. I'm going to talk about Microsoft and how we work at global scale. Uh, I spent the beginning of the week in Hyderabad with our engineering team there. We have about 25,000 engineers here. I personally work out of Seattle. Um, you heard in the introduction a little bit about me. Let me give you a little bit of background before I get into the demo. So you may know Microsoft's org chart. You may have seen this before. Um, this is uh, where we were, say, f six years ago. The uh, company was then running on the idea that every unit, every division would uh, run its own engineering system. And the idea was, well, if they do that, they'll know exactly what they need and they'll be able to, to be more effective and they'll be able to go faster and there won't be the corporate overhead et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the reality of that after two decades was that it meant every division went slower, everyone had to maintain their own cruft, everyone was stuck in their own place. It was very hard to move around because you didn't know how those other guys worked. And most importantly, the biggest unintended consequence was no reuse would go unpunished. So when I joined Microsoft, I remember hearing like in the second week, to take no dependencies. Uh, this was a kind of stupid place to be. So the good news is we were in the wrong place and uh, at least we recognized it. So about three years ago, with uh, Satya Nadella taking over as CEO and with a new leadership team, the policy flipped 180 degrees. We would go to one engineering system. We would make the best engineering system for ourselves. And we would use what we learned working in Microsoft to deliver this to customers. So. Uh, internally, it's known as 1ES, One Engineering System. Externally, it's known as Visual Studio Team Services. It's a SaaS. You can use it for free if you're a team under five. It costs a few dollars a month if you're, you're more than that. But it's, uh, it's publicly available. Uh, we run it out of 14 data centers worldwide. Uh, and I'll show you how we work. So this is... Uh, how actually when I submitted the talk, 65,000 engineers at Microsoft were working and the, the uh, four months since it's become 75,000. Okay, why did we do this? Well, we did this because we wanted to be able to achieve reuse. We wanted to be able to work with DevOps. We wanted all source to be able to uh, to be available to everyone. We wanted devs to be able to make improvements. We wanted to reward the assist. We wanted people to be able to move around the company. We wanted to make sure that the amount of time things took was proportional to the changes that were made, not proportional to the cruft in some, some old uh, uh, 
release system. So that's the background. Now let me show you what it looks like uh, day in, day out. I'm not, I, I, I would say it, a day in the life of an engineer, I'm not going to take all day. I've got a few minutes, so I'll go pretty quickly. Um, life um, in our pipeline starts with a pull request in Git. Uh, the pull request goes through a uh, it, 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 all the code should end up in master, so before going to master, the pull request goes through a build sequence. The build sequence runs automated tests. As Nathan pointed out, the good tests are the tests that run. I'll show you those. It runs some security tests, and it requires four eyes. It requires code approval from uh, an appropriate person. After those things have succeeded, those changes are committed to master, and then continuous integration runs off of master. So what you're looking at in these two widgets on my dashboard are first the pull request success rate, and you see there are a bunch of fails, that's okay. We want to catch the errors before the code goes to master, and then you're seeing continuous integration out of master, so you'll see, hey, this last one just ran, took 16 minutes for CI from master. Let's drill in first into what it means to have a pull request. So I'm going to um, uh, take a look at the specific uh, instance of the pull request. This is the summary page on one of those pull request builds. There's a, you know, the, these things on the left that you can't read are the steps in the, in the build. I'll describe those. Um, let me just start here. So that pull request, in order to run green in master, ran 6,237 tests. They ran in six and a half minutes. Okay, so about 10,000 tests per minute. Okay, maybe, uh, you know, 160 uh, uh, um, per second. The and all of them had to pass. If one failed, the pull request gets rejected. Okay. Now, with that are the associated changes, the code changes, what user story was being worked on, and so forth. All of this is hyperlinked, so if I open, for example, the user story, I can get from there to, hello, uh, what did I, I, I can get from the user story to the changes and so forth. Um, now, what is the pull request? I, I picked one here so you can see what actually happens in that pull request flow. You saw the 60,000 tests. They needed to run. There are also, you, I also mentioned this four eyes thing and this um, uh, security test. Well, one of the things in DevOps is you want everything to be fresh in a single code stream in master. And one of the things that happens is that if it, you don't get the four eyes, you don't get the review, this reviewer is blocking, the build and security test expire in 12 hours. So you have 12 hours to get the four eyes or you need to resubmit. And in this case, there's a specific review that says, hmm, not so sure about that. So this code did not go forward to master. That's an example of shifting way left. You submit your changes as a pull request, pull request runs the tests, the, the that pull request build is successful. You need the review, you need the security check on it before getting to master. Now, once that completes, so, oh, and by the way, if you can see these red bars, so maybe one in four, uh, roughly, if these pull requests will fail, that's fine. We want the failures there. 
You'll see the last 20 CIs, hey, they succeeded, which is good. So once you uh, go through the pull requests, you, uh, uh, if you run green on all of those and you get your approval, my, uh, net, this doesn't like my network, you will get into continuous integration. And to give you a feeling for the volume of CI that's, that we're running, this is, uh, these are the CI builds, so you're looking here at maybe two hours. Uh, it's kind of a slow time of day because uh, the U.S. hasn't woken up yet. Let me just flip to my uh, secure network, uh, which is my phone instead of the hotel, um, and uh, I'll take you through. So, so CI is running, um, uh, continuously and usually runs green, you know, so those one in four failures maybe go down to about one in 20. And then after CI, we have a, another set of tests. So the tests before in the pull request, those were what we call L0 and L1 unit tests. They run against the binary, the L0, L1s run against the binary independencies like the database. Now, after CI, we run all these other tests. I did not mean to touch something and click it. Um, the, these tests are being run in pre-production environments. The threshold we set for the pull request tests was they need to complete in under eight minutes. It used to be 10, we've gotten faster, now under eight. Um, and now we have a set of tests in pre-production. We call these L2s. They run with, uh, in real environments and in addition to binary and dependencies, these now are using uh, test data. Now, the columns with these little labels that you can't read are each column is a new build, each row is a particular suite of tests. You'll see most of them are running green 100%. A few run red, that means there was a failure. Sometimes you even see a yellow. A yellow means there's a flaky test. That is, sometimes the test runs green, sometimes it runs red. It's not obvious why it changes. Uh, so we uh, mark that as a flaky test so that someone will have to uh, investigate it. Let's take a look at a failure. Uh, let's not take a look at a failure if I'm not connected. Come on. Um, where is my network? Um, Okay, it thinks I'm connected. So, um, uh, it, so this is live, folks, right? Um, and I'm, uh, uh, it's, it's not, uh, I'm not faking it. So, uh, um, I'll, I'll, in the interest of time, I'm conscious, conscious of how much time I have, I won't walk you through all the failure. Let's go on and let's talk about what happens after those pre-production tests, what we call L2s. We go on to deployment. There's a little widget here on my dashboard. You'll um, see when I expand here, you'll see a clearer view of this. Now, what is a deployment to us? So a deployment, we stage, you'll see these six columns, we stage across deployment rings for progressive exposure. So the leftmost ring, which we call ring zero, is our canary. That's where we work. Ring one, the data center with the smallest user population. Ring two, the data center with the largest user population. 
Ring 3, the data centers with the highest latency to reach. So from the US, Australia is, uh, uh, is there. And then the next two columns are both Ring 4 parallelized. Uh, so it's, it's everyone else. And if you look at 857 right here, you'll see a deployment that went straight across through all the rings. If you look at where we are right now uh, with 864, the, last, the, the most recent one failed in the canary. That's what we want to see. And uh, it'll be restarted shortly. There's one that is, meanwhile, going through um, from two to three and is pending approval to go into the next data center. We use this to slow the deployments down. A deployment can go through all data centers worldwide in uh, a few hours. When we're doing a deployment um, with a uh, large batch at the end of a sprint, um, we slow them down so we can watch the telemetry, be comfortable before we move on to, to the next. And, and that's exactly what you see with the blue. Let me uh, just also make clear what it means to, to have these deployments. The service we're running is 24 by 7 by 365. We don't do downtime. Okay? As a customer, you will uh, be able to connect anytime from anywhere, and uh, we guarantee the availability and we guarantee the performance. So this deployment is not only using the rings, it is also for each user account updating on a replica and then swapping the updated replica with the master and then updating the new replica, which was the old master. So there's no perceived downtime for a customer. And, the, and there is always a live version, and that live version is at most a few days old. Now that's one way we control exposure. The other way we control exposure is by using what we call preview. So if I click on my personal profile and look at preview features, you'll see that I have opted in to the new boards hub, the new queries experience, and so forth. And I haven't opted in yet to YAML. Um, uh, definitions, and if I choose to opt out, I get prompted here, hey, why do you want to turn this off? And that lets us get feedback directly. So that lets us set criteria directly on the user experience. Nathan talked about it's all about the user. Well, when we roll out new capability, we measure it like this. So. One of our criteria will be, hey, you have something current there, you're rolling out a new user experience, you need to have 95% opt-in before that be leaves preview, before that becomes generally available. So we can continually experiment with the control and the treatment, and we can continually update that experiment and understand what users want to do. All right. So that was a, a really quick look at how we work. Um, and that's live. I'm going to flip back to slides now and talk a little bit about some learnings we've had. Uh, what? Come on. Ah, sorry, I'm already presenting. Okay. So as I said, this is Visual Studio Team Services that we're using. 
Underneath it for version control is Git. We're all in on Git. We um, want Microsoft to be all in on Git. However, there's a problem. Git, as it is, sucks with large repos. And we, you know, for our Windows colleagues, uh, would say, well, you need to use Git. And uh, they would say, uh, yeah, but um, we have this really big repo. And uh, the longest, uh, the longest and most heated email discussion I've ever seen was around, well, how should Windows be refactored so that it can fit into small repos, yada, da, 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 da. And the idea of spending this long time in a dark tunnel refactoring merely so you could adapt to version control with no visible customer benefit, that didn't go over so well. I don't know how it would do in your world. So instead of forcing that change on Windows, Windows has been refactoring and has been getting leaner, we improved Git and introduced the Git virtual file system. Because Windows' uh, biggest repo is 270 gigs. To, give, to put that in perspective, hours for uh, VSTS itself is three gigs. Linux is well under a gig. So, we introduced the Git virtual file system. This is now public, it's open source, we made it open source on GitHub. Uh, it means that for Windows, for example, what was a 12 hour clone, if it succeeded, that is typically if you tried to clone that repo using classic Git, uh, you better make sure your laptop doesn't go to sleep in the middle of it, because if it does, you need to start over. But instead of 12 hours, it's now two and a half minutes. Things like a commit, instead of taking 30 minutes, take seven seconds, okay? So we're looking at improvements of around 300x in performance that we made to get, we contributed it back to the community so that we could work this way ourselves and others could benefit from it. We're all in on open source. We're all in on contributing to open source. If you look at the contributors on GitHub, there are by 2x more from Microsoft than any other company. What do we measure as part of this DevOps culture we do? Well, Nathan talked about, about these things with different words, but, but the first three are kind of similar. So we measure live site health. We think about live site first. What is the customer experience? And we're looking at time to detect, to communicate. That is, letting everyone know on the blog and on Twitter how long it, uh, uh, is there an availability issue? How long should they expect? What's the status and so forth? Time to mitigate. Uh, what's the customer impact? That is who is actually impacted. We, we look at SLA by customer. And then no, we, we have an idea that no live site incident, no LSI should be wasted. Everyone is a gem. And f it is not closed until we do the root cause analysis. And that root cause analysis prevent, creates incident prevention items, and those items go on the backlog and they need to be closed in a sprint. So you'll see up in the top of the dashboard, number, each row is a feature crew, uh, or think of it as a scrum team or a squad, we call them feature crews. You'll see number of LSI repair items older than two sprints, they're healthy with none. Then we look so that's the, the aging live site problems. We look at, of course, customer support, what customers are reporting to us in, though our goal is that for any LSI, we find it from our telemetry first. And uh, as I mentioned, the SLA is by customer. That's live site health. That's what's 
that's in the source of truth that is in production. We do that with a telemetry pipe to give you an example that right now across Azure services is, is uh, producing about two petabytes, petabytes with a P of data per day. Uh, that's available, by the way, to you as application insights analytics off of Azure. The second column, velocity, is the other direction. How long does it take to get from the change to production visible to users? So we, of course, measure time to build, time to test, to deploy, um, and time to implement the learnings. So you saw we can we actually set thresholds on how long those tests are allowed to run. Eight minutes is the cap for the pull request. Um, and uh, we're doing better than that now across 60,000 tests. The engineering caps are, are the governors of quality or debt. Things like um, number of active bugs per engineer. If you're on a team, a feature crew with 10 engineers, if bug cap is four, you may have 40 open bugs. If you exceed that, you need to stop, pay down your bugs. If you look at what it is in practice, you'll see number of active bugs per engineer here from the scorecard at two or three. Um, so that mean, it doesn't mean every individual has active, but it means out of you know, a crew of 10, you'd have 20 or, or uh, th 30. Uh, at a time. Otherwise, you have, um, you have to stop and pay off. And, oh, and, and I did not show, but I should show that um, what this actually means in practice is that the team, of course, is working across a Kanban board, and they are tracking their work. And the Kanban board is split, in this case, into swim lanes, this one called DRI. That stands for Designated Responsible Individual. In other words, who is on call? The principle is you build it, you run it. So everything has an engineer uh, from development uh, assigned that you, know, you do rotation. You expect to do roughly a week per quarter uh, of DRI duty. And the rule is you're on the bridge during an LSI within five minutes if it's work hours, within 15 if it's outside of work hours, if it's your DRI time. So that's a swim lane for that reactive work. And um, down here, you have swim lanes for other things that this squad is working on. So uh, things like th these guys are working on the REST APIs. And you know a healthy board looks something like that. You have a bunch of things in the backlog. That is things we're planning to do in the sprint. You have a little bit that's active, although if you notice, this crew is over its WIP limit with uh, 14 things active when they should only have 12. Uh, so there's a warning there not to take more in. And then a bunch of things in the bug bash that is there trying it, and of course, then it all moves to closed. So that's an example of how we are actually working you know, bottom up at the crew level. Um, we, of course, track whether bugs get aged beyond the sprint. You need to close them uh, within a sprint length. That's this uh, number of uh, active bugs beyond 21 days. I showed you test pass rate and coverage on the dashboard. So those are all of the things that were touched on uh, by Nathan now in practice uh, to get quality from our perspective continually at speed. There's one more column here about usage. That's the outside in view from the customer. So we're also using that telemetry pipe to understand our acquisition. How good are we at getting customers? How good are we at 
engaging them, that is making them return. And then how good are we at, getting, at making them dedicated? For us, we measure dedicated as they're on uh, the majority of days of the week. And then does anyone churn out unexpectedly? And we can drill down from that overall picture to specific feature usage. So that's what we measure. I talked about the telemetry pipeline with, with uh, what's internally called CUSTO, uh, externally Azure Application Insights. Now I said we do root cause analysis continually. If there is a significant outage for customers, we also publish it. So we will put on the blog what we found from the root cause. Here's an example about, it's, it's one of my favorite uh, RCAs. It's about 18 months ago. Um, we had an incident where underneath the service we flipped to uh, SQL 2016. Um, and query plan optimization changed. So all of a sudden we had all these memory spikes in the data tier that were unexpected and we had to change a bunch of sprocks to do so. So we, we go into great detail about how actually we did have to uh, modify the, you know, our own database code so that people could learn from it. We work in team rooms. That is not a huge open space. That is a space for the particular feature crew. So when they want to have their stand up, they just walk to one end of the room, have the stand up. If they want to talk about something during the day, they can swivel their chairs. Uh, it is, uh, and it's fine. There are little focus rooms around the side. But the idea is this way you, you are using Conway's law about the organization shipping the software that reflects its structure, you're using Conway's law to your advantage. You structure the org around the software you want to ship. We also let engineers self-determine how they want to fit into that org. We're doing this right now. Uh, we do this about 18 months. Uh, when we want to uh, reorg, we will pick the leads of the feature crews, let them uh, uh, get them together in a room like this, they'll stand up, they'll, each will take two minutes and say, hey, we're the crew called uh, Modern uh, Social Flows, and here's what we're doing, and we're the best ones because, and you know, do their little pitch, and then the next ones will go and say, hey, we're called uh, uh, Blueprint, or, and we're the best because, hey, we're continuous delivery, we're the best because, and so forth. And then, every engineer gets to take three sticky notes and say, uh, here are my first three choices for where I want to work, one, two, three, and we try to fit them into the crews they want to be fit into we do well over 90% on this, 90% um, first choice. One engineering at Microsoft is important enough that we do a 1ES day, which is way oversubscribed, and then a lot of people get the content afterwards by video. Um, we're talking about, you know, a huge number of sessions, huge number of booths, um, uh, contributions from around the company. And Satya, in his monthly town halls, will also feature 1ES progress. As I mentioned, we're now at uh, something over 75,000 internal users as of the end of uh, last month. And what we use internally as first party is available to you as well. And we think that we need to maintain that virtuous cycle of going from trying it in first party, trying it for ourselves, and bringing that out to customers. 
So that's a quick look at uh, how we've moved Microsoft from this highly divisive organization that was frankly very waterfallian to a place where it's DevOps by default in the public cloud on Azure. Our source code is on Azure. Our practices deploy to Azure. We do it uh, many, 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 many times per day. Um, there are thousands of deployments to Azure per week. So I'm, I'm open for questions for a few minutes and would love to answer anything on your mind. Go ahead. Um, Sam, a quick question. How are you managing prioritization between so many users for your sprint stories? How do we manage prioritization uh, uh, with regard to sprint and, and the backlog? That's what you mean, yeah? So uh, we organize uh, in a hierarchy of epics and within epics uh, um, uh, crew. So the epic will, uh, so for, for example, across uh, VSTS, which I've just shown you, we have eight epics. One of them for engineering improvements, the others are externally facing. You can think of the uh, epic as being uh, uh, the work of, say, four to seven feature crews. And a feature crew is typically 10 or 12 engineers, sometimes a little bit more. We plan the epics in six months. Uh, in six monthly increment, we call this a semester. Uh, and in that six month planning, we say, what are the needles we want to move? What are the KPIs that are important? And we will set those. So for example, uh, continuous delivery is an epic and we look at uh, the, the rate of deployments uh, and growth in deployment automation among our customers and how many of those go to Azure and so on and so forth. That's an example of an epic and its needles. Within the sprint, which is three weeks for us, the feature crew looks at those needles for the semester for their epic and says, what's the next thing we need to do in order to move the, our needles? And they prioritize the backlog accordingly. Now, about every three sprints, we have a planning chat. We just uh, went through this last week where the leads of the crews get together and they basically say three weeks, I'm sorry, three sprints ahead, here's roughly what we're planning to do. And you have discussions like, um, uh, hey, looks like two of us are doing the same thing, we should make that one service, you take a dependency, whatever. So we will look about three sprints ahead in down to the detail of, of features and stories, not more than three sprints typically because we don't want that to get stale. and We don't want to waste effort on planning. And we'll have this notion of what the needles are for the six months. And then uh, the crews will work pretty autonomously uh, in the sprint. They'll say, here's what we're doing. And then the sprint plan for the, the plan for the next sprint along with the review for the last sprint will be communicated by one email from each feature crew. The email will contain a video which acts as a stakeholder review for the sprint. And that will get widely commented on. So it's needles every six months get set by Epic. Synchronization every three sprints across Epics and crews. And then within the sprint, what do we need to do against those needles? I can show you much more offline, but I'll... I said, please. So you said you run 60,000 tests. Is there any time tests fail due to infrastructure issues instead of developers' code changes? And how do you mitigate the infrastructure issues from code changes, code change fails? 
Of course, tests fail around infrastructure. Now, the 60,000 I showed were actually before the ones that would probably be sensitive to the infrastructure. There are another 10 or 20,000 that run post CI in um, production realistic infra. So if anything fails there, uh, it will be um, uh, hit there. Now, as I said, uh, an LSI, a live site incident, is a terrible thing to waste. So we're very conscious of anything that actually happens in production as well. We are running all of, we are running this on Azure, primarily using Azure Pass, the platform as a service, though we also have things that are in VMs and containers within that, depending on the individual service. Um, we treat the infrastructure changes as code. Azure is something called Azure Resource Manager Templates that we use, ARM templates, and uh, all of that is versioned. We use our own uh, CICD, which I gave you a glimpse of, which will track changes and, and identify these things. So uh, if you want to change the uh, deployment or do you change the the infra, you're doing so in code, it should be caught by the pipeline. Uh, if, by exception, it's not caught by the pipeline, that, and, and triggers an LSI, that will be done in a way where we've minimized the blast radius through progressive exposure, but we will capture that LSI, we'll root cause it, and we'll say, hey, do we need to do something more in terms of control over infra? Do we need to do more in terms of tests? Do we need to do more in exception handling? Do we need to change something about the pipeline? And the output of that five whys will become uh, in the incident prevention items that then go on the backlog for, for subsequent engineering. Okay, and, th and those need to be closed as soon as possible, certainly within a sprint. So we'll have the last question uh, for, for today, because we are out of time. Anyone? Okay, so I hear I'm getting the hook. I will be around today. Please feel free to, you know, find me. Um, I also have some colleagues here. We'll be happy to, to field any further questions uh, uh, afterwards, but I don't think I should stand between you and lunch. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you so much, Sam, for sharing your insights and experiences with us.